The field of neuroscience is an incredibly exciting field to be working in, to be studying, and to be teaching. Many people think of the field as being about 50 years old. It was in the mid-1960s that the first universities began to have academic departments devoted to neuroscience, graduate programs devoted to neuroscience. In 1969, the Society for Neuroscience was founded, and now, 50 years later, it has 35,000 members and affiliate organizations in almost 100 countries. And much of what we're going to be talking about in the course to come this semester is going to focus on those last 50 years where the field has exploded year by year and decade by decade. But these 50 years of neuroscience didn't start from scratch. In fact, they built on 2,000 years of work by philosophers and doctors and scientists trying to understand how the brain worked. So today, I want to take you on a very brief 15-minute tour of those 2,000 years of prehistory of neuroscience. So buckle your seatbelts and be prepared to find out where and how did the study of how does the brain work begins. This history will cover the first 2,000 or so years of the field from about 400 BC until the 1950s. And we'll focus on three classes of questions which have predominated over these last two millennia as people struggle to understand how does the brain work. These three classes of questions begin with philosophy, functional anatomy, and lastly, cellular mechanisms. And let me tell you some of the questions that each of these areas have asked. In philosophy, the questions that have predominated have been, what is the brain good for? Is the mind distinct from mechanisms of the brain? Functional anatomy has asked a number of different questions that try to localize where in the brain different functions occur. Some of these questions are, what is the functional role of brain subregions and nerves? How can we understand and treat different mental health disorders? Can localized brain lesions tell us about the functional organization of the brain? How is memory organized? And how and where are learned reflexes formed? The third class of questions are about cellular mechanisms, questions such as, what is the structure of individual neurons? What is the function of neurons and synapses? And how do neurons use electrical signals to communicate? So these three classes of questions have emerged over the last two millennia in the following sort of approximate timeline. So the philosophical questions began early on when there wasn't a lot of technology, there wasn't a lot of data, from 400 BC to what is the brain good for, to the early 1600s when philosophers asked, is the mind distinct from the mechanisms of the brain? Questions about functional anatomy emerge in sort of the middle period, sort of from the early BC, even up to the early 1900s, asking of the variety of questions about how do we localize function to specific parts of the anatomy. And lastly, with the development of sort of newer technologies for looking at and measuring um, and analyzing the brain, we see the cellular mechanisms have emerged later in history. So now you understand the timeline. There are going to be 10 uh, questions that I'm going to focus on starting in 400 BC and taking us through the 1950s. The first question was back in Greece, where Hippocrates and Aristotle argued about the question, what is the brain for? What is the brain good for? Now, Hippocrates believed it was the seat of intelligence, it was key for sensation and perception, and it was what was disrupted in epilepsy, three things which have still held true um, even all these years later. Aristotle thought the brain was a cooling mechanism, something like a radiator for the blood, and he believed the heart, not the brain, was the source of rationality and intelligence. Well, clearly these two ideas turned out to be wrong, but to his credit, Aristotle got many other things right about psychology and philosophy in the brain, including the fundamental principles of learning and the essential role of experience in knowledge, what we call empiricism. Moving ahead in time, Galen, often called also Claudius Galenus, asked, what is the functional role of the brain subregions and nerves? Galen was a physician, and his main day job was working for the Romans, fixing gladiators who had been damaged after battle. He believed temperament and bodily functions were controlled by the brain. And he dissected sheep, monkeys, and dogs to learn more about the body because Roman law at that time forbade autopsy on humans. Now, from these autopsies that he did, the, the, these dissections on animals, 
he made a number of conclusions that have still held true today. He concluded that the hard cerebellum in the back of the brain was for muscle control, while the softer cerebrum around the top and around the, 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 the shell of the brain was for the senses, and that, that we know to be true. He dissected nerves and believed that each nerve pathway controlled a different set of muscles, again, something that still has held true to this day. Moving across to another part of the world, uh, there was a renaissance in about 1000 AD of Muslim science and medicine that spanned not only Iberia, southern, southern Europe, what we now call Spain, um, and Portugal, all the way to the Middle East. And this Muslim renaissance uh, gave us many advances in science and in, in medicine. And, and it particularly focused on the question, how can we understand and treat mental health disorders? And one of the great Muslim doctors and scholars was known as Al-Zahari, and he lived in Islamic Iberia, and he described many surgical treatments for neurological disorders and brain trauma. And he wrote a 30-volume encyclopedia of medicine called the Kitab al-Tasrif. The surgery chapter of that volume was translated into Latin and for the next 500 years became the standard text. Uh, not that uh, anyone today would really want to uh, participate in any of these surgeries, but at the time, from 1000 to 1500 AD, they were state-of-the-art in neurological surgery. At around the same time, in Persia, Ibn Sina asked, um, he, also known as Avicenna in other rings, he's often viewed as the father of modern medicine, and his textbook, The Canon of Medicine, was used for hundreds of years. He described numerous psychiatric disorders, including mania, hallucinations, dementia, melancholia, or what we now call depression, and even described a constellation of symptoms in people that he called Junun Mufrit, which maps very closely to what we view as schizophrenia. So he really developed a lot of the basic understanding and classifications of the different mental health disorders. He also identified and named the cerebellar vermis and the caudate nucleus. And lastly, he posited the brain as the place where reason interacts with sensation. Um, and that was really critical, that it wasn't just the thinking, it was the interaction between thinking and reason and sensation. And we very much believe today that, in fact, that's where much of that intersection takes place. We now go back to Europe next, to the 1600s, where René Descartes asked the philosophical question, is the mind distinct from the brain? Now, Descartes was a firm believer in dualism, the principle that the mind and body exist as separate entities, each with a different characteristics and governed by its own laws. He also believed that the pineal gland was the link between the mind and the body. The pineal gland lies sort of in the chest. Well, clearly these two approaches, these two ideas haven't held up well. On the other hand, he did develop the idea of the reflex arc, an automatic pathway from a sensory stimulus to a motor response. Um, and he diagrammed it here in, in a sketch which pretty much captures how we see reflex arcs to these days, coming in through the eye, going to the brain, and going out through the muscles in order to point. By the mid-1800s, there were a number of people, Bell, Florence, Harlow, Broca, Wernicke, who all asked, can localized brain lesions tell us about the functional organization of the brain? We'll go through each of these five men in, in order. Charles Bell in Scotland asked, um, again, asked this question about localized brain lesions and what it tells us about functional organization. He discovered through dissection and vivisection that the spine transmit motor impulses and receive sensory input. He was a talented artist, and you can see one of his engravings in the upper left corner, and he published a very influential engravings of the, of the brain. He also described a facial paralysis, which is today, which is caused by, a, by a, a damage to a nerve in the face, and is today known as Bell's palsy after him. In France, Jean-Pierre Florin showed that localized brain lesions in rabbits and pigeons produced specific deficits in motor control, sensation, and behavior. And he made three important linkages. He linked the cerebrum to cognition, the cerebellum to movement, and the medulla to vital bodily functions. And all of these are basically the substance of what we believe today. On the other hand, he didn't get everything right. He was a fervent creationist, and he argued against Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Over here in the United States, John Harlow had a patient named Phineas Gage who was working on the railroad when a frontal, his frontal lobe was pierced by an iron rod. 
that you can see here from an autopsy, literally went through his cheek, through his eye, and into his frontal lobe. And surprising everyone, Gage survived. He still could talk. He could still sort of function to some degree. But he lost what we think of today as executive control over his behaviors. He became impulsive and easily distracted and, and angry. And so it was from this that Phineas Gage suggested that this part of the brain, the front part of the brain of Phineas Gage, was uh, critical for these kinds of executive controls over our behavior. Pierre Broca in France studied 12 patients who lost the ability to speak but were still able to comprehend. And when these patients died and he autopsied them, he showed that they all had damage in the left frontal lobe, an area of the brain now known as Broca's area, and, and believed and, and known to be key for speech. Over in Germany, Karl Wernicke was looking at some very different patients that were the, essentially the inverse or the opposite. He studied patients who lost the ability to comprehend, but they were still able to speak. Again, on later autopsies, he showed that these people had damage in the superior temporal gyrus, an area now known as Wernicke's area and critical for comprehension. And you can see in the, the diagram there, a modern diagram, the difference between Broca's area and Wernicke's area, suggesting that comprehension and production of language are subserved by different brain regions. Moving ahead to the late 1800s, back in the US, William James asked, how is memory organized? He taught the first course in psychology ever given in America. And he was especially interested in how we learn new habits and acquire new memories. And to explain the development of memories and how one memory can trigger another memory, he described a network model where he suggested that at one event, a dinner party, you might remember the taste of the food, the sight of a particular lady, the smell of her perfume, topics, and so forth. And this event, this dinner party, shares some overlapping features with another event, which was going dancing, where he saw the same lady, smelled the same perfume, although in this time in a dance hall with many other things happening. And so James suggested two things that are really important here, which are still part of our, our understanding of how memory is organized. That memories are built up of associations among elemental components that come together to form the whole memory. And the ways in which we relate one complex memory to another comes from pathways from associations that go from the common elements of one event to another event. At around the same time in Spain, Santiago Ramón y Cajal asked, what is the structure of individual neurons? And here we begin to get down into the molecular mechanisms, the cellular mechanisms, um, in this case, of, uh, of the brain. He utilized a cell staining method from Camillo Golgi. And from his work, from his analysis of these cell stainings, he developed what he called the neuron doctrine. And he argued that the functional unit of the brain is the neuron. And this was later supported by electrical stimulation studies of Luigi Galvani, who stimulated with electrical current and showed that you could activate muscles and other movement. In 1906, Cajal and Gogli shared the Nobel Prize. And here, to see what, what an exquisite uh, artist and, and scientist he was, you can see here the Roden Hippocampus from 1911. Um, and it's just a phenomenal level of detail that he was basically able to both see and to share. Charles Sherrington, by the early 1900s, asked, what is the function of neurons and synapses? He published an influential book called The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. He coined the term synapse, which we use today, for the point of contact between two neurons. And he studied the behavior of neurons that were either activated or inhibited at the synapse. And he argued that it's the balance between activation and inhibition which is key to muscle movement. And for this accomplishment, he won the 1932 Nobel Prize. Moving across back to uh, the European, uh, Ivan Pavlov in Russia was asking, how and where are learned reflexes formed? These sorts of reflexes um, that Descartes had talked about uh, many years beforehand. Now, this wasn't his initial interest. He initially was interested in the digestive glands of dogs. But inadvertently, he discovered how reflexes, such as salivation, can be conditioned or trained as a learned response to a previously neutral cue, such as a bell. And in exquisite experiments over the coming years, he was able to characterize all the various parameters by which learning and extinction, the unlearning, can take place. And for this, in 1904, he was awarded the Nobel Prize. We come now to the last of the sort of historical uh, uh, landmarks that I wanted to share with you, 
We're up now into the 1940s and the 1950s, and Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley asked, how do neurons use electrical signals to communicate? They develop what we call the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which describes how the firing in a neuron is initiated and propagated to the next neuron. And from this, they develop biophysical models of the electrical characteristics of neurons described, shown in the, in, in, the, in the graph there in the lower left. And for this, they won the 1963 Nobel Prize. So over the last 15 minutes, I've taken you on a tour of about 2,000 years from 400 BC in Greece, uh, through the Roman Empire, to the Muslim Middle East and Iberia, France, Europe, the US, Spain, England, Russia, um, and to back to the USA. And we've seen the development of all of these various questions that were being answered or addressed with whatever technology was available during the day. So I had said at the beginning that we can think about the history of neuroscience as being three different approaches, approaches of philosophy, of functional anatomy, and cellular mechanisms. Today, there's not really much philosophy, although there are people who study the philosophy of mind, but the focus of neuroscience is on three other areas now. There is the functional anatomy still, which is a, a, a really important area. There is cellular mechanisms, which we began to see in some of the history. Uh, but more recently, there's been an understanding of molecular mechanisms, what happens inside the cells from the molecules that are moving around inside and between cells. You'll see more of this in the weeks to come, in the months to come in this course. Functional anatomy is now a critical part of behavioral neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and neuropsychology, all of which will be presented in the, uh, the weeks to come. Cellular mechanisms are a critical part of the quest for neurophysiology, for understanding neuropharmacology, and neuropsychology, and some of that you'll be seeing in the next few lectures. Molecular mechanisms have been the most recent addition to what we try to understand about the brain. Um, it has drawn on the fields of molecular biology, genetics, and protein chemistry to really get us down to the, the nuts and bolts of how the brain works at a molecular level, which helps us understand at the cellular level, and which in turn leads us to understand the functional organization of the brain. Now, all of these are basic science endeavors, and that's the main focus of this course, but all of this has an impact on neurology and psychiatry, the understanding of sort of brain disorders and mental health disorders. And as we understand functional anatomy, cellular mechanisms, and molecular mechanisms of the brain, they help us understand some of the neurological and psychiatric syndromes that are presented in medicine. And so with this as a, an overview of the history of neuroscience um, and a, a, how this relates to the structure of the current field of neuroscience, you're now ready to begin what I hope is going to be a very exciting course in the semester ahead that will introduce you to the field of neuroscience.